Leviticus chapter 13 includes God's commands for his ancient people regarding someone who had leprosy. The leprous person who has the disease shall worn where shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose, unkempt. He shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So says Leviticus chapter 13. Well, throughout the Bible, people and places and things are declared either clean or unclean. It had to do with their suitability for inclusion in ceremonies and such that had to do with uh, uh, what God had ordained, what God had decreed. So if someone had touched an unclean person or ate an unclean food or went to an unclean place, then they were unclean until they participated in a cleansing ritual. They could not participate with the people of God at all if they were unclean. So this idea behind this, um, uh, the idea behind this was that God wanted his people to remember that they were a people set apart, chosen by him, for him, for his purpose. God, God wanted his people to be constantly aware that they were his. And they were to live particularly under his authority. So Levitical law required that a person who was unclean with leprosy must be intentional, as we just read, about appearing unclean. So he had to wear torn clothing, couldn't comb his hair, had to wear some sort of mask over his upper lip, live far away from everyone else, and if anyone even came near him, he would have to shout out, unclean, unclean. <clears throat> Can you imagine? Leprosy is spread through moisture droplets from the nose and the mouth. So leprosy is a progressive illness that mainly affects the nerves and the skin and eyes and the lining of the nose. Gets real bad there right away. The leprosy brings a slow, painful death. Well, while, while the physical pain of leprosy was debilitating, the social and emotional and spiritual consequences of leprosy were humiliating. So if a person contracted leprosy, they could no longer hug their kids. No longer hold a job working alongside others. No longer share a meal with friends or family. No longer worship in the synagogue with God's gathered people. No longer travel to Jerusalem three times a year for the annual feasts. So in a society thousands of years before modern medicine, these laws also guarded all of God's chosen people who he had rescued, delivered from slavery in Egypt, it guarded them from dying out in a leprosy pandemic. Leprosy has surfaced, resurfaced in India today. I've read horrible accounts of people who are homeless and helpless with leprosy. Wild dogs would lick the pus and the blood from their open wounds. And in some cases, rats would chew on their toes as they slept but they couldn't feel it. Can you imagine? Can you imagine yourself as a leper in first century Galilee? Oh, sure, you, you heard some, some wise teacher who's a powerful healer, so, some man from Nazareth, and he could make people clean? What if you heard that he was making his way from synagogue to synagogue throughout the countryside, and he would soon be in your village. He was heading your way. Well, you know that the law forbids you from going into the synagogue near people because you have leprosy. So what would you do? Well, if you, if you try and clean up or even cover up and enter the synagogue to get near this teacher, you could be killed by an angry mob, maybe by stones. You're an outcast. If people even get near you, they contract this deadly disease. You are unclean. What would you do? Next slide. The gospel of Jesus, according to Mark, is the good news. 
that the Son of God and Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life. Give his life as a ransom for all who would turn to him in faith. How would Jesus respond to you and your leprosy? Please turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Verse 35, or on page 837 in those black Bibles under the chairs, page 837. So my prayer for us throughout this series, in the Gospel of Jesus according to Mark, is that we would be able to see Jesus as he truly is. So we treasure him and we trust him in our daily lives. He's worthy of our trust. Last week we saw verses 21 through 34 claim that Jesus has the ultimate authority over everything. We know that if our Lord does not have ultimate authority over everything, our faith is in vain. If something could ruin his plan to rescue you and save you for eternity, your faith is in vain. But it's not. It's not. Because he is Lord over everything. So today we turn our attention to verses 35 through 45 where Jesus prays, a leper please, and they switch places. Let's pray as we open God's word together. Father, would you open our eyes to see you as you are? God, would you set these wonderful words of life on fire in our hearts, that we would have open eyes and attentive ears to see you as you are? God, that even though this is a real historical event, there's a real man who really was healed of leprosy. Thank you that it points us to this biblical principle that Jesus can make us clean. That we are cast out from your presence by our sin. And that Jesus can make us clean. So God, be glorified. This is my offering. I've asked you to work in me and through me this week as I prepare and pre to preach by studying and praying and such. And God, receive this for your glory. God, use it to build us up and mature us in Christ for your glory. Please come soon. Amen. This is the word of God. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I might preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went out throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once, and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. This is the word of God. This historical account can serve as a metaphor for the biblical principle that Jesus took the place of believing sinners to heal us forever. Well, this principle is presented through a simple outline. The son prayed, the leper pleaded, and then they switched places. So first, the son prayed. Well, as we saw last week in verses 21 through 34, there, there's a description of Jesus' first full day of public ministry, a full day indeed, even for him who is fully God and fully man. He taught in the synagogue. He cast out a demon from a man who was there. He healed Peter's mother-in-law, probably enjoyed a big Sabbath meal with his buddies. And then toward sundown, you can imagine he was ready for some rest, ready to relax a bit. And there was this knocking at the door. Turns out the whole city had gathered outside the door to see this miracle-working teacher. Well, the Lord Jesus did not turn them away. But he healed those who were sick with various diseases, cast out many demons. So I was reflecting on this last week. I want to say that I'm often exhilarated as I am exhausted on Sunday afternoons. 
Worshiping together is the highlight of my week. For us to be gathered as a church, it's the highlight of the week for sure. It's exhilarating. I love this. You can see it in me. But since I pour everything that I am into Sunday morning, quite honestly, it can leave me pretty exhausted. Pam will tell you what I'm like on Sunday afternoon. I'm spent. So on Monday mornings, I go to an undisclosed location to read and to pray and spend time with the Lord by the golden arches. Excuse me. As a way to just get get prepared for the coming week to get refreshed, kind of refill the tank. Well, when I was a college student on a mission trip trip back in the early 90s, the mentor who led our small group often said this. He said, Paul, if your output exceeds your input, then your upkeep will be your downfall. So if any of us try to bear fruit for God without making sure that our roots are receiving input and the nutrients that we need because they're firmly placed in the soil of time with the Lord. We'll end up exhausted, we'll be less and less fruitful, and eventually crash. Beloved of God, if your output exceeds your input, your upkeep will be your downfall. Well, surely Jesus prayed to the Father daily. Mark made a point to include three specific times that Jesus prayed. Next slide. The first is right here in verse 35. The morning after his first very full day of public ministry where he preached, cast out demons, and healed people, he prays. Second time is recorded in chapter 6 after Jesus sent out his 12 disciples to preach, cast out demons, and heal people. So the disciples returned, Jesus fed 5,000 people and dismissed them, and then he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. The third and only other time that Mark records Jesus praying is in chapter 14. It's in the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus anticipates his own death. He's praying with his disciples before he was arrested. So each of these three times, Jesus went to a quiet place, and he was anticipating opposition. Of all the things that Jesus could have done to prepare for this public ministry and to prepare to face opposition, Jesus chose to pray. To understand, Jesus didn't go read a book about spiritual warfare. He didn't ask his closest friends to give him a pep talk. Jesus spent time with his Father. This is instructive for all of us. For any one of us who want to bear spiritual fruit for the glory of God, spend time with the Father. I have to tell you, as I often say, I can't handle God's word rightly in front of you unless I ask him to handle me with it. So I have to confess, the temptation for me is most often to do things that feel productive. And quite frankly, it's not sitting in a chair or being on my knees somewhere. Someone seems like the most immediately effective thing that I can do is study or write or make a phone call. Even when the ultimately important thing that I should do is invest time with my father in prayer. What about you? If your output exceeds your input, your upkeep will be your downfall. So the purpose of prayer is glorifying our father by strengthening a relationship with him as we pray. So the more we spend time with the Lord in prayer and reading his word, the more we know him. The more we know him, the more we trust him. The more we trust him, the more our lives bear genuine fruit for the glory of God. So here's Jesus. God the eternal son in human flesh, he wanted to get away and be alone with his father. But his disciples searched for him. It was fun looking this up this week. I I was shocked to see, but this verb's translated searched for him in verse 36. It could also be translated hunted him down. (laughs) So this is a casual search. So so the word has a sense of urgency, certainly a sense of intentionality. So Simon Peter and the other disciples saw Jesus' popularity on the rise, growing crowds. They may have thought, hey, might as well make the most of this. Jesus, what are you doing going off by yourself? Let's do this. So at this point, their idea of the kingdom of God was much different 
than the kingdom of God that Jesus had in mind. So then Jesus told a parable that addressed the phenomenon of the growing crowds to make it clear that Jesus was interested not in crowds, but in converts, genuine believers who would trust him. So Jesus stuck to his purpose, knowing that the Lord is sovereign over salvation. So he spent time with his father in prayer. He preached, he cast out demons. All of this was for the purpose of proclaiming the kingdom of God in every synagogue he came to. So I, I've said before, there are over 200 villages in the region of Galilee. So over 200 synagogues, each little village had its own synagogue. And each synagogue, it's central to life in the community. It's much different than it is here in Ripon. It was central to the community. Relationships in the synagogue were the threads that wove the fabric of the whole society together. Well, at least, you know, for those who are allowed to participate. After Mark tells us about Jesus praying, we read about a leper pleading. It was a gutsy move. <laughs> gutsy move for a man with leprosy to approach anyone, let alone this popular teacher with crowds that I was surrounded in. So this leprous man made his appeal on his knees, so this, this word kneeling, in verse 40, is best understood as an expression of reverence and honor while humbly seeking help. Here's this man, this leper. Remember, unkempt hair? Had to look disheveled on purpose. Who knows how disfigured he was? On his knees, he cries out, If you will, you can make me clean. Well, the fact that the man said, If you will, means that he recognized that Jesus had the ability to make him clean. He knew it was a matter of whether or not Jesus willed it to be so. It struck me this week. Notice the man with leprosy didn't ask to be healed. He didn't ask to be healed of his leprosy. He asked to be made clean. Because if he was clean, he could rejoin society. So it strikes me that the, the physical pain of leprosy was brutal. But that wasn't the worst part. The most agonizing part were living as a person with leprosy. I learned this week that uh, people with leprosy were required to stand 50 paces, this law on top of law that the early teachers added, the Pharisees and such. That is a 50 paces from any other person. So you couldn't get within about 125 feet of a leper. No hugs, no handshakes, no close conversations. No pats on the back. Leprosy in this culture was not just debilitating, it was entirely humiliating and lonely. Well, this man's emphasis on being made clean certainly underscores then the social and emotional and spiritual consequences of being declared unclean with leprosy. So if a leper was careless and somehow accidentally touched someone, then that person would become unclean. And maybe even become lepers. So just, just imagine. Picture that here. Imagine somebody coming in. They walk in the back. Open the, open the door. They're, <coughs> they're hacking. They're coughing. And they're like, I have COVID! I have COVID! I have COVID! And they sit right down next to you. So, <laughs> In this first century, everybody knew what leprosy was. Everybody knew what leprosy did to a person. You can imagine the fidgeting of this unsettled crowd as this man made his way toward Jesus. How, how, how would this teacher, this healer, how, how would he respond to this bold act of faith from this unclean man? Look at him, he's unclean, he's unkempt. He looks the part. Ugh. Well, a man unclean with leprosy approaching a teacher would shock the whole crowd. But what happened next was beyond imagination. Jesus was moved with pity by this leper who came to him and said, if you will, you can make me clean. Now this word translated pity in verse 41 that can also be translated compassion. So it's not pity like looking down on someone. Oh, I pity that guy. It's a, it's a tenderness towards someone who is hurting. So when the man with leprosy approached Jesus, 
Jesus didn't jump back and say, hey, easy there, pal. I can heal you from back here with a word. Keep your distance. You ever hear of social distancing? Jesus didn't do that. No. In fact, the opposite happened. Our Lord was moved with compassion. Jesus moved toward the man and he touched him. He didn't turn away and jump back and avoid his touch. He moved toward him and he touched him. Who is this man? Who is this teacher? Who is this healer? Who knows how long it's been since this man has been touched by another human being? Months? Years? And here he is with a compassionate touch by one who is not just fully human, but him who is fully God. So picture the scene. If the man had not been visibly, obviously, completely, fully restored immediately, the people would have accused Jesus of being unclean since he touched the guy. Jesus didn't become unclean by touching the man with leprosy. <laughs> he cleaned the leprosy from the man. He cleaned the leprosy. You could say that by touching the unclean man with the leprosy, Jesus took on the man's uncleanness on himself and gave the man his cleanness, we'll say. That's glorious. Who is this? Who is this? Who is this Jesus? Well, this is the key principle in today's verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 words it like this. For our sake, he, that is the Father, made him, the Son, to be sin. But he knew no sin. Why did he do this? So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Approach God's throne of grace with confidence. No longer approaching him screaming, unclean, unclean, sinner. Le Le um, Leviticus chapter 14 tells us that any person who had been healed and become clean from leprosy needed to have this affirmed, you know, confirmed, this healing confirmed by a priest. And once they had proof in writing from the priest, then they could rejoin society after they offered these prescribed offerings at the temple in Jerusalem. This was intriguing as I learned about this week too. So the initial part of this offering involved two birds. One of these birds was killed so that the other bird could be dipped in the blood of that other bird and set free. <laughs> Those birds didn't have a choice. The birds didn't have a choice. One of them died so that the other could live and be set free. Jesus had a choice. Jesus chose to be killed so that you and I, by faith, could be set free through his blood. And they declared clean and acceptable to God forever. That's the good news of the gospel. 1 Peter chapter 2 says it like this. It says, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And chapter 3 has these words. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God that he might bring us to God. The righteous suffered for the unrighteous. If you're a believer, you're the free bird that was dipped in the blood. You're the leper that took on Jesus' cleanliness. Jesus switched places with believing sinners to make us clean forever. We don't know. We, we don't know if the former leper obeyed and went to the priest and did the offerings and saw that picture of those birds and going, that's me. I'm set free because this other one was killed. This other one was wounded. By the blood, this blood, I'm, I'm healed. 
So we don't know if he listened to Jesus to go to the priest. But we do know that he disobeyed Jesus when it came to keeping quiet about this healing. When we look at this first century culture, the oppressive Roman Empire, the Jews are just trying to make a way and try to be faithful to God, many of them who, who wanted to be faithful. Well, well, many among them, though, anticipated a political savior who would free them from the oppression of the first century Roman Empire. Well, Jesus knew that they'd have moved to make him king on their own, so that would have hindered his mission to preach the gospel. So he told the man to keep quiet. Not, the time has not yet come. Look at the big picture here of the bookends of this section. The section starts off with Jesus going to every synagogue and preaching in the synagogues and, and healing. While this leprous man living outside the camp, 125 feet away from everybody else, forbidden to enter any synagogue. But Jesus was moved with compassion and made him clean. This section starts off, Jesus going to every synagogue. This section ends with this man able to enter any synagogue. But Jesus, it says, could no longer able to even enter a, openly enter a town. Well, people still came to Jesus from everywhere, but he couldn't do what he wanted to do in the synagogue among God's gathered people. In fact, it says he was in desolate places. Jesus switched places with this man. As I read through Mark over and over, it strikes me that Mark never describes leprosy as being healed. But here, in, in these few verses, we see leprosy being cleaned three times. A reference to being cleaned. So it, it's obvious that there was nothing a person who had leprosy could do to make himself clean. He couldn't heal himself. He couldn't clean himself. He couldn't fix it. He couldn't cover it up. There's nothing he could do to get back into society. It could only be God's gracious healing by some way. Well, you may have already been anticipating now how this points to the gospel. I hope you are. I hope that's the way you're always thinking. Well, we've seen that the consequences of leprosy were brutal. Not just physically, but socially, emotionally, spiritually brutal. So leprosy and its consequences are a vivid metaphor for the sinful nature that we were all born with. Let's walk through that. Sin, like leprosy, also affects us physically and socially and emotionally and spiritually, but in an infinitely more significant way. So physically, leprosy makes the parts die off to the point where if you touch fire, you might not even feel it. You'd burn your hand. Maybe you wouldn't even be able to tell until you could smell your burning flesh. Similarly, the nature of sin is that we start to become numb to it if we persist in it. So at first we're grieved by our own sin. But if we persist in it, we no longer feel it as it slowly destroys us. Socially, leprosy requires complete isolation. Le leprosy cuts us off from family and friends and from the people of God. So this man with leprosy could not have his normal family time or have a job and interact with friends and family and neighbors. Well, similarly, the brokenness of sin affects every human relationship at least to some extent, doesn't it? Sin affects families, marriages, co-workers. Sin affects us socially, for sure. Well, so the physical and social effects of leprosy took their toll on a person's emotions too. As you've seen, people with leprosy were required to look as repulsive as possible to ensure that no one came near them. Can you imagine? And yet, rebellion against God doesn't always look like the unkempt leper with the torn clothes, does it? Rebellion against God includes appearing like a pretty decent person. Who doesn't make his or her life about God and his gospel. Like leprosy, persistent rebellion against God it fills us with feelings of fear and shame, but on a much more significant scale. Sin affects us physically, socially, and emotionally. But even worse than the physical, social, and emotional effects of sin is the ultimate spiritual effect of sin. So God created us to be in a relationship with Him, as we know, but, but sin rendered us unclean, unclean before God the Father. 
Well, just as this man with leprosy was unable to clean himself, so you and I are unable to make ourselves acceptable to God the Father. Our only hope is that this wise and powerful teacher will meet us right where we are and because of his astonishing love, switch seats with us like he did in that first century interaction with the leper. So Jesus hears the pleading of unclean sinners and restores all who believe to a right relationship with God the Father, takes our sin, gives us his righteousness. This restoration is only accomplished by Jesus switching seats with believing sinners so that we can be made clean forever. Ephesians chapter 2 speaks of this new seating arrangement this way. It says, God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Did you see that? See the new seating arrangement? Next slide. God, the eternal Son, left the glorious presence of God the Father to take on human flesh and accomplish this work so that all who believe could be seated with God the Father in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Have you switched seats with Jesus? Have you switched seats? Well, we've already seen the importance of this idea of being in Christ Jesus in Mark. Remember early on, Jesus identified himself with us in his water baptism. But at that baptism, those precious words, the Father's words are for all who are in Christ by faith. The Father said to the Son, You are my beloved Son, and with you I'm well pleased. With you I'm well pleased. image bearer of God created by him for his good purpose if you are in Christ by faith you're no longer unclean by sin this Christ this Lord Jesus switched places with every believing sinner to make us clean forever so Jesus taking the punishment that you deserve on the cross means that God the Father is pleased with you he's pleased with you and he's pleased with you, and he's pleased with you, and he's pleased with you, and he's pleased with you. God the Father is pleased with you because he's pleased with the finished work of his Son. So Jesus not only took on our sin that made us unclean before the Father by switching places with believing sinners, he also gave us his righteousness to make us clean forever. That's the news of the gospel. And I hope you see it as you read Mark because it's bursting out everywhere and it's glorious. And this is what we proclaim when we participate in the Lord's Supper together. This is what we proclaim, the, the necessity of Christ's death, that someone had to die, and it could have been us. And there's a sufficiency in Christ because of his righteousness. So by his wounds, we are healed.